Hey, I'm Dr. Morales, and in this video, I'm going to talk about blood thinners for AFib. I want to talk to people who specifically say, do I really need to take one? I don't want to take a blood thinner for the rest of my life. Completely understandable. So in this video, I'm going to talk about why blood thinners are prescribed, understanding risk of stroke. I'm going to talk about blood thinner options. I'm going to talk even nat talk about natural blood thinners as well, as well as uh, procedural options for, for stroke risk reduction as well. So let's talk about blood thinners for AFib. Um, blood thinners is the most common, one of the most common questions that I get from patients who say, I don't want to take blood thinners. And it's understandable. You get bruises easily. You don't want to take blood thinners because there's risk. You know, and there's risks for significant bleeding. There's risk of injury, uh, having a significant injury if you, if you hurt yourself when, when you're on a blood thinner. So it's significantly, it's definitely something very uh, concerning, but they do work very well to reduce risk of stroke. So let's talk about risk of stroke first. For anybody who has AFib, it's very important to know what your overall risk of stroke is and because that really determines whether or not you need to take a blood thinner long term because I'm sure everyone would agree, stroke, having a stroke is the most debilitating consequence of, of having an AFib. I mean, when somebody gets a stroke, their life is changed overnight forever sometimes because sometimes the stroke symptoms are not reversible. So having a stroke is the most disabling, terrible consequence of having AFib and so stroke risk reduction is a very important strategy of managing anybody with uh, atrial fibrillation okay and so understanding your risk your personal risk of stroke is probably one of the most important uh, features about understanding this question about whether you need a blood thinner and what's the right treatment option for for you okay and so the most commonly used scoring system for understanding your individual risk of stroke used by myself and using by grand majority of doctors out there is called the CHADS RASC risk score. Uh, C-H-A-D-V-A-S-C. Uh, each one of those initials stands for something and, and helps a doctor like myself calculate your risk of stroke from AFib. C stands for, for congestive heart failure. H stands for hypertension. A is for age uh, less uh, 65 to 74. D is for diabetes. S is for past stroke. Uh, B is for vascular disease. Age is for uh, uh, age, uh, another age for age greater than 75. And SC stands for sex uh, category, uh, which women get an addi additional point. So all of these uh, different little parts here give you either one or two points depending on the individual uh, risk that you have, such as having age greater than 75 it actually gives you two points, whereas age less than uh, 65 to 74 is only one point, for example. But some of them are two points, some of them is only uh, one point. And then I'm going to include a link underneath this video so you can help calculate what your own individual uh, CHADS VAS risk score is. And that really helps give you an idea as well as your doctor at this point, what they how they calculate what your individual risk of stroke from. And so the CHADS VAS risk score may go all the way from zero all the way to nine and that helps understand what the risk of stroke is for over a year. Uh, so the lowest people who have the lowest risk factors, you know, you don't have all those things that I mentioned to you, the CHADS VAS risk score is zero, you know, that risk of stroke is less than 1%. Uh, but people who have all the risk factors, you know, that CHAS VAS risk score of nine, that's a risk of stroke of approximately 12% uh, per year. So there's a lot of variability depending on your age as well as risk factors in terms of having and understanding your overall risk for stroke, okay? So obviously if you understand what your risk of stroke is, then you understand why some medications are recommended. Um, according to the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology, both stronger blood thinning medications, and I'm going to talk about the different options, is recommended for anybody with AFib who has a who is a man who has a CHAS vas risk of score of two or greater, or a woman with a CHAS vas risk score of three or greater. So a little bit of smile, difference whether you are a man or a woman. So two for man or three for woman. If you and if your points are higher than that, blood thinners are usually recommended. Why is that? Um, so it's been going by many years, um, started, actually studies go back into the mid-1980s, I believe, where warfarin was the original stronger blood thinner. It was the first one that had been around for a very long time. And back in the 80s, there was studied that warfarin would significantly reduce risk of stroke. They had, back in those days, they actually compared warfarin to aspirin because that was what was available at that time. And it was actually studied multiple times, what's better, warfarin versus aspirin to reduce risk of stroke. And over and over and over again, warfarin won uh, over aspirin in terms of reducing that risk of stroke. And it just became very clear that 
stronger blood thinning medications are needed to give a satisfactory stroke risk reduction. So for many years, warfarin was the main treatment option for reducing risk of stroke for people who have AFib, especially if your stroke risk was high enough to warrant taking a blood thinner. Uh, in general, if your stroke risk is relatively low, like if you have a zero or one in the, uh, on the stroke risk score, taking strong blood thinners is optional. Fortunately, nowadays, there's newer blood thinning medication options, uh, very popular ones out there now, which have been out for several years now. Uh, Eliquis is a very common one, so is Xarelto, Pradaxa, other ones out there, another one called Cerveza. Uh, the good thing about these is that they, are, um, they work slightly different than, than Warfarin does. In addition, it doesn't, the levels don't fluctuate that the way that Warfarin did. Warfarin was a medication where your levels could fluctuate so much from day to day depending on what you eat, depending on your other medications, and your levels could fluctuate a lot. And there have been studies that looked in the past that have shown that people, you know, many times people who are taking warfarin, they may not be in the therapeutic range a good amount of time despite the, the fact that you're actually ta taking the medication. So uh, having these newer medications has been a great uh, advantage for a lot of patients with AFib. And in general, these newer medications are by far recommended for somebody new who ha has AFib these days because the blood level thinning is consistent. Uh, when all these newer medications were approved, they were all compared to uh, warfarin and they showed that they were equivalent in terms of stroke risk reduction. So they all, whether it's warfarin, Eliquis, uh, Zorelto, all these blood thinners, they reduce risk of stroke by about 60 to 70 percent. So studies have time and time shown again that stronger blood thinning medications uh, reduce risk of stroke significantly for, for most people with AFib. What about other uh, blood thinning options? Uh, people frequently ask me about aspirin, uh, you know, can I just take an aspirin for AFib? It's a very common uh, question that I, that I have. And it all goes to relative blood thinning effects. You know, some blood thinners are just stronger than others. You can imagine somebody who's lifting weights at the gym. Who, you know, who can lift more weight? The guy, that, the person who lifts 20 pounds or the person who lifts 100 pounds, you know? So the blood thinners, yes, there are different kinds of blood thinners. Some things will thin your blood, but it's about the relative strength of that blood thinning effect. And definitely the blood thinning effect of stronger blood thinners like warfarin, Eliquis, and Zarelto have time and time again when studied in tens of thousands of patients have shown that it is significantly reduces the risk of stroke by usually about anywhere from 60 to 70 percent. But getting back to aspirin, aspirin was compared in studies in the 80s, you know, we're talking about almost 40 years ago now, uh, that it was not as good as warfarin. Uh, and that's because it is a relatively much lighter blood thinning medication. It's not nearly as strong as warfarin or these other newer blood thinner medications in terms of how it actually thin string your blood and its relative strength. And so that's why it doesn't work as well for reducing risk of stroke for AFib. Now it's commonly used for other heart conditions as well. Uh, people who've had uh, blockages in the artery heart that you may be recommended to take an aspirin. But when it comes to stroke risk reduction, uh, it's just usually not sufficient for AFib uh, to the point that the most recent guidelines of AFib that came out a couple of years ago it's pretty much stopped recommending a, a aspirin for AFib because it really just showed that it really didn't make a difference in terms of actually reducing people's uh, risk of stroke. So in general these days, if your stroke risk is high enough, again, that's a stroke risk of two for men or three for women, stronger blood thinners are recommended. If you're on the lower spectrum, nothing is really necessary at, at this time going by the American Heart Association or American College of Cardiology uh, guidelines on treating people with, with AFib. Now, what about natural blood thinning medication? Another common question I get, uh, there's a few natural blood thinners out there. Um, Natokinase is probably the most commonly one that people get uh, asked me about. There's um, a few other options out there, uh, even things like uh, turmeric and some of the others, uh, and, and uh, natural things maybe have some blood thinning effects to it. They certainly can thin your blood, but then this all goes into the relative strength. What is a stronger a blood thinner? Now, when it comes to natokinase, which is a very common or popular uh, question I get on uh, natural blood thinners, uh, there are only studies I've actually seen about the blood thinning effects were in a petri dish. I mean, there's never actually been looked at in a human being to see how well that this actually thins, thins your blood. So all I've seen it is in a petri dish or, you know, in a lab experiment, and it is significantly less of a blood thinning effect than aspirin. So I just told you that aspirin was not strong enough to reduce risk of stroke for people who have AFib, and natural blood thinners are going to be even weaker than the aspirin to in terms of its blood thinning effects and its ability to reduce risk of stroke because 
risk of st risk of stroke is what we're trying to reduce here. We're not trying to just thin your blood for no reason. We're trying to reduce risk of stroke. And clearly, time and time again, the stronger blood thinners, uh, such as uh, Eliquis, Sorelto, or Warfarin, have been around a long time, have shown that they are completely uh, a much better option for reducing uh, risk of stroke. In addition, I also wanted to mention there has been emerging evidence over the last several years about the risk of dementia with having uh, AFib. People who have AFib appear to have increased risk for dementia. And some of that may be because there's just uh, for the long spectrum of having AFib, you have AFib for years or sometimes even decades, there can be just tiny little blood clots uh, that go to your brain, not enough to really give you a stroke or like, hey, that one day I had a stroke, but then over the course of many years, you have many of them and then increases the risk for uh, dementia. So that's certainly been emerging evidence over the last few years. And what decreases that risk? Blood thinning medication like Eliquis or Zorelto. So which is, this gives another added uh, reason that stronger blood thinners are unfortunately needed for the grand majority of, of people that have AFib. Now, what about getting procedures for AFib? Let's say you get an ablation procedure for AFib, you haven't noticed any symptoms for AFib, can you just stop the uh, blood thinner? Um, the, unfortunately, the answer these days is no, because it appears at, at this time, procedures for AFib, although they can be very successful, they can, uh, there's never a 100% cure, meaning that you'll never have AFib again for the rest of your life, and you never think about it, and your risk of stroke goes down to zero. Um, so there, because of that, it's been a long time recommended that the, you, know, you go off of your risk of stroke based on your risk of stroke from that Chad's vast risk or not whether you had an ablation procedure or not. And so I kind of counsel that to my patients when they come to see me and say, I want to get an ablation because I don't want to take this blood there anymore. Well, if your risk of stroke was high before an ablation procedure, it's still high af after an ablation procedure. And so that uh, risk of stroke is still going to be there and blood thinners will commonly still be needed even after an ablation procedure. What about people who can't take blood thinners? You know, let's say you are, have been taking blood thinners for a while and you've actually legitimately had a, a medical problem from it. You know, you either had significant nosebleeds, bleeding in your stool, bleeding in your urine, you have low blood counts or anemia, nobody can really figure out why. Uh, say you are somebody who's prone to falls, you know, say you have balance problems and you have a significant injury risk. Well, that can be quite problematic to take strong blood thinning medications if you've already had some legitimate bleeding issues or if you actually are significantly a, a fall risk to, to injure yourself. And so at some stage, you have to have a discussion with your doctor about whether being on blood thinners is worth the risk. And there's certainly plenty of patients out there where the risk of the blood thinners actually tend to start to outweigh the benefit of actually, if you, especially if you've had some significant bleeding issues or you have a legitimate fall risk issue. Fortunately, these days there's actually excellent procedure options right now. Um, when people have AFib, the main risk of stroke comes from an area in the left upper chamber of the heart called the appendix. There's like a little pocket in the left upper chamber of the heart. That's where most blood clots form. That's where the main risk of stroke of AFib comes from. So people take blood thinners uh, to reduce the risk of having a blood clot in that left, uh, left atrial appendage, that little pocket in the left upper chamber of the heart. Uh, but obviously it thins your blood everywhere. You can, you know, get anemia, get ble ble bleeding in your stool or your urine. Um, but it does help to reduce the risk of blood clots in that little pocket right there. However, getting rid of that pocket, getting rid of that appendage can actually help you get off of blood thinning medication. Then there's actually been data that shows that it is safe and people, and you can actually prevent the risk of stroke from doing it. There's a few ways to do it. Uh, these days, one of the most common ways is called a watchman procedure. This is a procedure that I do, and many uh, uh, cardiologists and electrophysiologists do this. Basically, go in through your groin, take a catheter that goes up to your heart, and deploy a plug from the inside that helps seal that area off so that it's no longer uh, part of the circulation. It's like sealing off a little pocket area of the heart. Um, and it can be very useful for reducing uh, risk of stroke. Watching has been around a long time. It's been approved for well over five years now. Been plenty of real-world data will show that it's safe. It's effective and it can help reduce uh, risk of stroke while not needing the really strong uh, blood thinning medication. So it certainly can be an option for many people. These days there's actually a few com competitors as well. Uh, uh, there's another product called the Amulet which came out pretty uh, pretty recently. Does something very similar to Watcher, just a different shape made by, made by a typical company. And it's actually very good that there's uh, different options out there right now. In addition, there's also surgical options as well. There's ways in which a, a heart surgeon can actually sew down or, or clip that uh, appendage area from, from the outside, which also may 
work to help reduce risk of stroke to where you don't need to take blood thinning medication. But fortunately, all of these involve procedures. Um, I've done many watch visit people and I found it to be a very good option for people who otherwise cannot tolerate uh, traditional blood thinning me medications. So hopefully at this video you realize that blood thinners are actually really important uh, and they can be very helpful for reducing risk of stroke as well as risk of, of dementia, but there may not be the right treatment for everybody. Um, it, depending on your risk of stroke, you may not need strong blood thinning medication. There was also procedure options as well. Okay? Uh, if you're worried that you may be stuck with your uh, blood thinners for the rest of your life, um, your risk of stroke can change over time. So your risk of stroke, what it is today, may not be that way in a year or two. Now, there's some things that you cannot change. You cannot change your age, uh, which you could get younger, but I mean, there's no way to really get uh, younger or change your age. But things such as your high blood pressure, diabetes, they can get better. And so your risk of stroke, which may be a four, might be uh, one or two in a, in a few years if you lose lose weight or improve your blood pressure or improve your di diabetes. So that risk of stroke can get better over time and that may reduce your risk of stroke and maybe you end up not needing blood thinning med medication as well. Uh, for people with, who have AFib, lifestyle modifications are absolutely essential. Uh, they can help reduce re your reliance on, on medications well procedures, which is why I, I created the Take Control of AFib program. The Take Control of AFib program is a step-by-step -step plan to reduce AFib naturally to improve your symptoms, reduce inflammation, and reduce your reliance on medications. So underneath this video, there's going to be a link to, to my program where you'll get to learn more about the program itself, understand what's included in the program, as well as see testimonials from people who have actually taken the program and see what they have to say. So click the link underneath the video, check it out for yourself, and I wish you the best for your AFib.